Chapter 2 of Quest of the Golden Ape by Randall Garrett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Quest of the Golden Ape Chapter 2 The Great Clock of Tarth The plains of Ophrid on the planet Tarth stretched flat and monotonous as far as the eye could reach a gently waving ocean of soft, knee-high grass where herds of wild stads grazed and bright-hued birds vied in brilliance with the flaming sun. From the dark Iberian forests to the ice-fields of Nadia the plain stretched unbroken except for the tall, gray tower in its exact center, and it was toward this tower that various groups of Tarthans were now moving. Every nation on the planet was represented in greater or lesser number the slim, erect Nadians in their flat-bottomed air-cars that could hang motionless in space or skim the surface of the planet at a thousand jecks an hour, the grim-faced Abarians, tall and finely muscled on their powerful stads, their jeweled uniforms flashing back the glory of the heavens, the Utalians, those chameleon men of Tarth, their skins now the exact color of the grasses across which they rode thus causing their stads to appear unmounted and unguided. All the nations of Tarth were represented, drawn toward the tower by a century-old legend, a legend which Retok the Abarian clarified as he rode at the head of his own proud group. He waved a hand, indicating the vast plain, and spoke to Hultax, his second-in-command, saying, Little would one think that this flat, empty land was once the site of a vast and powerful nation one of the greatest upon all Tarth." A smile of cruelty and satisfaction played upon his handsome features as he surveyed the plain. Ay, Hultax replied, the realm of the Ophridians. Truly, they were a great nation. But we Iberians were greater, Retok snapped. We not only defeated them, but we leveled their land until not one stone stood upon another. All save the tower, Hultak said. No weapon known could so much as scratch its surface. A new voice cut in. Quite true. Portox's scientific skill was too great for you. Both Iberians turned quickly to scowl at the newcomer, Bontark of Nadia, who had swung close in his one-man car and was hovering by their side. Retok's hand moved toward the hilt of his long whip-like sword, driven there by the look of contempt in Bontark's eyes. But Retok hesitated. A formidable squadron of Bartok's Nadian fighting men hovered nearby, and the Iberian had no taste for a battle in which the odds were close to even. "'We defeated the Ophridians fairly,' he said. "'And slaughtered them fairly. Cut down the men and women and children alike until the entire nation was obliterated.' The systematic annihilation had taken place a century before, when Pontark had been but a child and Retok a young man. Karnad, Retok's father, now dead, had planned the war that defeated the Ophridians, his winning card having been spies in the court of Evala, queen of Ofrid. Karnad had been fatally wounded during the last battle, and had delegated to his son the task of annihilating the Ophridians, and leveling their nation. This task Retok accepted with relish, reserving for himself the pleasure of slaying Queen Evala. Details of the torture to which Retok subjected the beautiful Evala were whispered over the planet, and it was said the sadistic Retok had taken photographs of the Queen in her agony to enjoy in later years. It had been the scientific ability of Portox of Ofrid that had engendered the Iberian hatred and jealousy in the first place. Portox used his science for the good of all on the planet Tarth. But when Karnad, lord of Iberia, struck, no other nation came to Ofrid's aid. Then it was too late, because Iberia's military might greatened as a result of the Ofridian defeat, and only an alliance of all other nations could have conquered them. Ironically, Portox had never been captured. Now, as the tall gray tower came into view, Bontark's mind was filled with thoughts of Portox, the Ophridian wizard. It was said that Portox had been able to travel through space to other planets that were known to exist, 
that he had left Tarth and found safety somewhere across space, first building his tower which would never be destroyed. That a great clock within it was measuring off one hundred years, the time on the planet Tarth of an infant's development into manhood, and that at the end of that span the clock would toll and there would come forth a man to avenge the slaughter of the Ophridians. Bontark turned suddenly upon the dour Retok. "'Tell me,' he said, "'is there any truth to the legend that the clock in the tower will toll the end of one hundred years?' "'None whatever,' the sadistic Abarian snapped. A rumor passed from the lips of one old woman to another." Bontark smiled. "'Then why are you here? The hundred years are up today. Retok's hand moved toward his whipsword. Are you calling me a liar?" Bontark watched alertly as the blade came partly from its scabbard. "'If we fight we may miss the tolling of the clock,' he said evenly. With an oath Retok pushed the sword back into its scabbard and put sharp heels to his stad's flanks. The animal screamed indignantly and rocketed ahead. Bontark smiled and turned his car back toward his own group. And now they were assembled and waiting, the curious of the planet Tarth. Would the clock toll as it was rumored Portox had said? Would an avenger come forth to challenge Retok and his Abarian hordes? There was not much time left. Swiftly the clock ticked off the remaining moments and the end of one hundred years was at hand. Silence settled over the assembled Tarthans. Then a great sound boomed over the plains a single ringing peal that rose majestically into the air, reverberated across the empty land that once had been the site of a thriving, prosperous nation. The first part of the legend had been fulfilled. Then suddenly chaos reigned. With a great thundering that shook the ground upon which they stood, the great tower exploded in crimson glory. A great mushrooming blossom of red fire erupted skyward, hurling the assembled Tarthans to the ground where they lay in numbed stupor. The thunderous report echoed across the plain ten thousand times louder than the tolling of the clock. But aside from the initial dulling shock, no Tarthan was injured, because the crushing power rose upward. There was an expression of mute wonder on Bontark's face, and he thought, We have not seen the end of this. It is only the beginning. But the beginning of what? Only Portox could have known, and Portox was where? Bontark started his car and moved across the plain, sensing cosmic events but not knowing. Not knowing that the sound of the tolling clock had gone with more than the speed of light across the void, had been flung arrow straight to a brooding mansion in the heart of a thick forest upon another planet to the door of a cavern deep in the rock beneath the mansion. That even now the lock of this door had responded to the electronic impulse, and the huge panel was swinging slowly open. End of chapter 2